Hello, I'm George Liston, CA. Welcome to Dialogue, a program that explores the world of ideas and issues in international affairs, history, and culture. In the wake of September 11, 2001, the security of the nation's transportation system was a subject of immense public concern. The spectacle of thousands of lives lost in a brutal subversion of aviation security was one that no one ever wished to see repeated. And the vulnerability of other modes of transportation to terrorist exploitation was just as much to be feared. But today, five years after the tragedy of 9-11, we must ask what has been achieved in strengthening the transportation security of the United States. Despite a raft of initiatives, is the public more secure in its use of airlines, railroads, highways, and seaports? The answers to these questions may not be comforting. My guest is William Johnstone, author of 9-11 and the Future of Transportation Security. William Johnstone, welcome to Dialogue. Thank you. It's Thank a delight you. to, uh, it's a pleasure to have you, and a delight to have read this book, um, which is the fruit of your service as a member of the security Transportation Security Staff, the 9-11 Commission, and of course, much further research you, that you've done. And let me hold this book up, uh, Bill Johnstone, because I think that its very title gives me my very first question to you. It's, uh, as you see, as everyone sees, transportation security, not aviation security. Mm -hmm. And the first question is this, is that a reflection of your concern that perhaps there's been too much attention or an unbalanced degree of attention mm -hmm. given to aviation security as opposed to other modes of transportation in our system? Yes, uh, in, a, in a word, yes. Um, uh, an underlying problem that we face today is a, an extreme difficulty that the Department of Homeland Security and the Transportation Security Administration have had and continue to have in setting priorities uh, across the different transportation modes. Mm -hmm. We still see that in, in the wake of 9-11, the lion's share of the resources, certainly, as, as well as the policy attention, have been directed at one or two uh, security layers, mm -hmm. namely uh, passenger uh, checkpoint screening and check bag screening of one mode of transportation. Uh, and that's probably, by my accounting, close to 70% of uh, the dollars right. that we spend. And it was somewhere between 60 and 70, depending on how you count the dollars. Mm -hmm. but. In my view, though, I, I won't uh, dispute that, the, uh, that some of those efforts have been needed, certainly, to beef up uh, security at the checkpoints and in, in uh, screening uh, check bags. Mm -hmm. It does mean that not nearly as much um, resource or attention has been available to cover not only the other modes, but other portions within aviation, for example, general aviation, Absolutely. cargo aviation, mm -hmm. for example. You know, uh, the, this is a book of marvelous detail, and uh, the argumentation is, is, is very complete. Uh, just to give the viewers a, a sense of this disproportion, uh, I was struck by this, Bill Johnstone, that you mentioned the 70 percent of, of funds that might go to at least portions of aviation security, yeah. but it tails off when you get into maritime and then down to land transportation, yeah, something at 1.4 percent? Yeah, I mean, it's varied. Uh, it's, it's certainly been well under 5 percent for yeah. all land uh, modes, and most of the land uh, spending has been on uh, mass transit security. When you get to highways and bridges, it's almost zero. Right. Now, even if we were to focus, though, for the rest of this conversation on aviation security, I think the book gives us a, a further cause for concern in the, in the fact that even that sector, even aviation, aviation sector, uh, aviation uh, uh, security mm -hmm. is underperforming. I mean, if you go through the various aspects you outline here, passenger screening, weapons detection, onboard methods, I think your, your, your argument is that it's pretty uneven. Yes, uh, the aviation security uh, had evolved, pre 9-11 had evolved almost exclusively in response to crises, to mm -hmm. disasters like Pan Am 103 or near disasters like the Bojinka plot mm -hmm. that fortuitously was thwarted. Uh, and it also was driven by kind of a least cost mentality uh, too, because these are after all pro profit making entities, right. uh, the airlines and, and airports, uh, and they're interested in, in making money, understandably. Uh, after 9-11, uh, 
provided a, a potential break from that model by all of a sudden elevating uh, aviation security in particular, transportation security in general somewhat, uh, to a, a real uh, national security issue that received a lot of policy attention, a lot of legislative attention, and a lot more money. Uh, you know, the the um, funding levels increased many fold in right. a very short period of time. But what I have found is while you can document, yeah, there were some immediate improvements in uh, aviation security based on the 9-11 plot. Mm -hmm. uh, we hardened the cockpit doors on, on passenger aircraft. Uh, we put more air marshals in the air and we assigned them to domestic flights. Mm -hmm. We provided at least some rudimentary improvements in the training, security training for flight crews, mm -hmm. uh, which disabused them of the old so-called common strategy training which pre-9-11 was to accommodate rather than mm -hmm. confront hijackers based largely on the experience with the Cuban hijackers right. and, and others. Um, and, and we did federalize the screener workforce. Uh, we stabilized that workforce, reduced the turnover, improved the caliber of the screeners. We got some more um, uh, electronic uh, and, and um, other uh, detection equipment right. for, for um, check bags deployed. And so in, in the bean count of security measures, Indeed, we have more security measures, mm -hmm. but the more important question, do we have more security? Uh, wherever, there, pr wherever performance data is available, and that's right. very spotty, the improvements have been less than one would have hoped given the expenditures and the right. attention from the checkpoints uh, on uh, through uh, through each of the layers. And of, entire uh, categories, if you will, of concerns seem to me to be under it. Um, uh, attended. That is, for example, cargoes, yeah. uh, uh, cargo screening. Yeah. Uh, from what this book says, is it, largely ignored. There, air cargo. Um, a, a small portion of air cargo is actually physically screened. Mm -hmm. uh, a larger portion is subject to review um, based on who the shipper or the the, the, the person, mm -hmm. the, the entity. Uh, sending the cargo is, and if they're suspect, then uh, they they uh, those packages are to get more security. Right. But efforts to expand on the um, uh, the portion of uh, of uh, cargo uh, that is actually physically screened have run into a lot of problems. Right. Um, most. Um, uh, Disturbingly, a debate has broken out on, well, what are the limits on how much uh, cargo could be screened? And when I think the figure is something like one in five passenger uh, aircraft are, are carrying cargo on board. Uh, so it, it's not, you know, it's not just on these uh, right. you know, cargoes going on, uh, on your, um, very often on, on flights that you're making as a passenger. Mm -hmm. uh, you and your check bags get a certain level of uh, scrutiny, scrutiny mm -hmm. that the cargo uh, that's flying underneath you uh, does not. Does and, not. That's and if you shift to other concern. modes, uh, for example, maritime uh, transportation, yeah. I think it's something like uh, less than six percent of our yeah, it gets actually screened. Are actually screened, and only yeah. thirty-four ports abroad are part of that pre-screening process. We we've, we've yes, yeah, so the. the Basically, the container security was ba was non-existent pre-9/11. I mean, we were concerned about smuggling, mm -hmm. uh, the Customs uh, Bureau, and you know, they focused on on drug smuggling and and the, the traditional uh, smuggling of of goods. Right. So they were starting from scratch there, uh, and and that has to be taken into account. But the um, it, it seems to me that. Um, one of the lessons of aviation security has been somewhat discounted in maritime security to date in that you can't rely on single layer protection, whether it's checkpoints at airports or in the case of maritime or pre-screening, that is scrutinizing right. the, uh, the list of shippers mm -hmm. uh, and figuring out whether something just based on who's shipping or what the circumstances of the, of the shipping are of whether that particular container should be physically screened. Mm -hmm. That's not in, sufficient. In my mind, it isn't, mm -hmm. because uh, systems can be gained, yeah. uh, gamed, um, 
uh, you can always have uh, breakdowns in, in your pre-screening efforts, right. whether of people or of cargo. Uh, and it's, uh, it's disturbing that so much of the um, container security initiative, for example, mm -hmm. uh, that Customs and Border Protection runs for uh, Department of Homeland Security, is reliant on this uh, this one layer of yeah. uh, pre-screening. I want to, uh, uh, the book uh, takes us back into the past, mm -hmm. prior to 9-11, of course, and into the present, what we're confronting today, and then, of course, uh, at the conclusion, points out to what our concerns should be to tomorrow, and I want to touch on all of that. But as a way of getting into it, William Johnstone, I, I would love to uh, ask you this question about what I detected as the underlying philosophy or the, uh, the concern you express uh, that I think cuts across all these uh, modes of transportation and of political uh, uh, action or inaction on them. First of all, the sense that perhaps we're too reactive mm -hmm. all the time, mm -hmm. um, that our goals are often in conflict. I mean, famously they were in, mm -hmm. in the FAA prior to 9-11. Uh, to, mm -hmm. to, uh, and that we probably lack a comprehensive policy that tries to bring everything together in one coherent philosophy. I, I, I would agree on, on all three points. Um, the, uh, uh, for example, on, on the question of, uh, of competing uh, priorities. Mm -hmm. I think that's absolutely true pre-9-11 and post-9-11. And it's of necessity. I mean, it's always going to be there. Mm -hmm. uh, Transportation systems are key components of our economy. Uh, so, as several people told the 9-11 staff and the commissioners when we were investigating uh, aviation security primarily, they said, you know, there's a surefire way to achieve 100 percent security uh, in the airways, and that's to shut down all the flights. Nobody flying, uh, no threat of, uh, of terrorist uh, usage of planes. Mm -hmm. But that uh, obviously, that, that mm -hmm. can't happen. But it raises the point that um, economics is necessarily part of the, of the equation here. Uh, you know, these are not nonprofit government enterprises, the, the airlines. Um, they may feel like they're less than profitable uh, right now. Right. Uh, but, you know, they're, it, it's, these are private uh, businesses. Mm -hmm. And the same is true for most of the uh, transportation right. sector. You know, very little of it is in government hands. Most of it is in the hands of folks that are, are, are in it for the business. Mm -hmm. And it has um, a ripple effect throughout the economy. If you shut down uh, a transportation sector, as we voluntarily did in the immediate aftermath of 9-11, mm -hmm. you're shutting down a big part of the economy. Mm -hmm. if, if it happened to, at our ports, at one of the mega ports in California right. or uh, New York, mm -hmm. the impact would be uh, far greater. Right. The problem today, I, I feel, is that there's been a failure to acknowledge that there are these trade-offs that, that necessarily must be uh, made, and therefore debates that need to take place. How much security do we want versus privacy, for example? The failure to resolve that question is at the heart of the lack of progress we're making on uh, improving the pre-screening of uh, airline passengers, the so-called Secure Flight program, which right. is a follow-on right. to the CAPS program. Uh, how do we resolve uh, questions of economic efficiency uh, versus um, uh, security? Mm -hmm. That lies at the heart of many of the um, uh, unresolved questions um, uh, about um, how much should we spend on these uh, other modes? Right. Uh, how much inconvenience should shippers or passengers uh, be uh, be forced to endure? And based on what level of uh, of threat or, or uh, acknowledged vulnerability? So, uh, and I, I think I, I take your your meaning to be that we have to confront those basic questions about Indeed. these interrelated priorities, and then and then proceed from there to establish a. Indeed, I I believe that the the, the failure to to tackle such fundamental questions as as this one, uh, mm -hmm. h how is uh, security to be prioritized, uh, or how is security to be organized, who's to be responsible for what, mm -hmm. and then who's to pay for security. And th those to me are the three fundamental questions that we have not done a good job of uh, addressing post 9-11. What would your verdict be? Um, of the bureaucratic reorganization we've undergone in response to 9-11. I refer here, of course, 
primarily to uh, Homeland Security yeah. as a department, you, uh, bringing together 22 other agencies. Yes, a, a daunting challenge, and and that I, I think there is um, there there are some cautionary tales in how we have um, reorganized Homeland Security post 9/11. First of all, right out of the box, just a few weeks after 9-11, the Transportation Security Administration was formed as part of the uh, Department of Transportation in, in the Aviation and Transportation Security Act of 2001 that was signed into law, I think it was in November uh, of uh, 2001, uh, but you know, just weeks after 9-11. After mm -hmm. And, and that was to take over basically the Office of Civil Aviation Security that had existed right. in um, uh, DOT within the, transportation. The, right, within the Federal Aviation Administration. As an afterthought in some ways, uh, Transportation Security Administration, however, was also given general responsibility for the security of all modes of transportation mm -hmm. because it was felt um, that there were many advantages to bringing um, uh, such um, security measures under one roof in terms of coordination, in terms of dealing with the intermodal connections that you know, right. can fall through the cracks if you go strictly through an inter a modal uh, administration. Uh, and, and so that was uh, TSA's original mandate. But it was quickly, uh, I mean, first of all, uh, at its outset, TSA was entirely driven by legislative mandates that had deadlines for federalizing the screener workforce and deploying explosive detection. But uh, so, so TSA was on its way uh, struggling to hire the screeners um, and to deploy some more explosive detection equipment. Mm -hmm. And then along came the uh, Department of Homeland Security in the uh, Homeland Security Act of 2002, right. passed a year later, which took TSA, the Coast Guard, and as you say, 22 agencies, a FEMA, mm -hmm. and, and threw them together uh, under one roof. Um, and all of the entities uh, from the department level on down have, have suffered uh, the growing pains. They've, they've had very large startup problems right. that, that continue to afflict them. Um, most surveys of employee satisfaction, for example, within the federal government um, would place the, the DHS components at or near the bottom it's of the uh, federal agencies. Yeah, yeah. Uh, the Coast Guard escapes that somewhat, given its strong uh, previous uh, culture. Mm -hmm. uh, but for the most part, these, uh, these entities have inherited very difficult work. And I want to stress that, that you know, it's easy for me to sit here and say, well, we're not doing a very good job in transportation security. But this is very, very hard to do. Absolutely. You, you have to, uh, I mean, look at the challenge. Yeah. They well, have. Yeah, I mean, I, I agree with you completely. But I, I, I want to say at this point, though, I think your book is very fair in that. I mean, there are there are uh, challenges that we have to face brought forth here. But I don't think that you ever indict anyone unfairly. I think there is great sympathy for the magnitude of things. Well, it it, it is it is a dawning challenge. Uh, but it, it's my view that while a lot of the attention has focused on failures of components of the system, and you know, there's. As, as I uh, allude to and document in some length in the book, there are myriad uh, cases of shortcomings in every mode, and mm -hmm. at least everywhere where there are performance measures. Mm -hmm. uh, many places we just don't know, yeah. uh, sadly, uh, of uh, how, how much uh, better the security is. Well, I was, I was struck by this uh, also that in many ways we, and I include all of us in this, not just those officially responsible, but we the public, uh, don't necessarily interpret our own experience in the best way. I'm referring to what we call the, the second you call the past, um, prior, you know, the prior to uh, uh, 2001 in your book. Mm -hmm. It was this, uh, in the, the 70s, the 80s. Mm -hmm. It was a, it seems to me an era in which we got very complacent about what we were, were confronting. Um, there was, for example, you mentioned the Bojinka. Mm -hmm. uh, that was a plot that actually didn't happen. Right. But it, it was kind of a warning to us that planes could be hijacked and things indeed. could happen. Uh, Bojinko was a, a plot that al actually had al-Qaeda uh, fingerprints on it to blow up 12 American airliners over the Pacific in mm -hmm. uh, 1995. Uh, and accidentally, I mean fortuitously, uh, the plot was uncovered and thwarted. Uh, and 
it was um, it, it it did get big. Uh, it had big repercussions for a while mm -hmm. in uh, U.S. aviation security, primarily in our operations overseas. Right. Uh, but the system had had traditionally only been able to overcome the inertia yeah. that, that typically set in when there was a major event, a tragedy a or a crisis tragedy. to react right. to. And, and, and then when there is a crisis to react to, I think you used the phrase here, we tend to think of it as being, quote, over there, yes. rather than something. Right. But, but you know, in, in the wake of Bojinka, there was, there's a further issue that really struck me that's brought out in this book. Uh, something that's called the Base Working yeah, Group. The Baseline was, Working Group. Baseline yeah. Working Group was established, which uh, I think did offer uh, recommendations that might, I don't think anyone can prevent future uh, horrors from happening, but it, it sort of was um, not given the attention it deserved. I, in, in the review of the history of the system, uh, the baseline working group, which was created in 1996 by the FAA mm -hmm. and industry, uh, largely as a follow-on to the Bojinka crisis. I mean, it, it stands out as one attempt to break out of the crisis response mentality. Mm -hmm. Because what they concluded after seeing the potential vulnerabilities revealed by the Bojinka plot is, well, we, we've got to ratchet up. The threat is much greater than we thought. These, these uh, new terrorists are a much bigger uh, challenge to us than anything we faced before. So they concluded that we need to look at a systemic uh, upgrade here, uh, the, the so-called baseline of security. Uh, we've been relying too much on um, response to uh, uh, immediate response to known and suspected plots where uh, through security directives and emergency amendments to the airline and airport uh, plans that they had to get approved by FAA that there be ad hoc adjustments and ratcheting up of security but we've let the underlying baseline that exists right. at all times in all airports slide. So what they said is we've got to do better than that. We need a, a, a strong baseline, number one, so that FAA, which is a regulatory agency, can inspect and enforce that baseline, right. which you can't do with ad hoc measures nearly so well. Mm -hmm. Number two, that the airlines and airports could um, see as, uh, as uh, be confident uh, and that it would be predictable uh, right. what they were expected to do and mm -hmm. how. Um, and, and number three, to provide the public with assurance that yes, the, the, when you go into any airport, get on any plane, mm -hmm. you can count on a certain level of security. Mm -hmm. So they uh, labored for a, a while and, and um, actually in a, in a great irony, mm -hmm. on the very day that they were to hold their first formal meeting, uh, TWA 800 uh, blew up. Uh, yes, but of course, yeah, in that tragedy, that would led us into a different direction. It, it did, because it almost immediately started pulling them back to this crisis and response mode because mm -hmm. TWA 800 was originally suspected to be perhaps a terrorist act. Right. National Transportation Safety Board later ruled that it was likely right. uh, an accident. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, but nonetheless, uh, the baseline working group continued with its work. Mm -hmm. They produced recommendations that called for a $10 billion program, you know, which was many fold above the hundred and exactly. some odd million being spent for uh, mm -hmm. aviation security. Uh, over over a 10-year period right. uh, to fix the problem, mm -hmm. and they primarily uh, through um, federal revenues because they saw aviation security as a national security okay, issue. Um, they call for things like vastly upgrading the FBI's role in uh, uh, helping to provide intelligence on uh, uh, aviation security. Right. They called for uh, making sure that the then soon to be unveiled uh, passenger pre-screening system mm -hmm. that became CAPS would screen, uh, lead to the screening not only of check bags, which it eventually came right. to be limited well, to, they, but also persons and, yeah. and um, carry-on luggage. Yeah. And they said we should train the whole workforce mm -hmm. uh, because from, uh, from curbside mm -hmm. uh, to the aircraft, uh, everyone has a potential role to play. That was all very prescient. Uh, it a, was. A decade ago. It was. Um, I think you've helped us understand in this conversation, as you do admirably in this, in this book, um, William Johnstone, all the factors that have gone into the, um, the, not only the tragedy we faced on 9-11, but the systemic 
issues we've been facing for a much longer period of time mm -hmm. than that. As we close our, our conversation, I would love to have you hopefully turn us to the future, if, if, if we may, much, very much as the book does. Um, and then just in a very brief fashion, give us the principles for better action, better outcomes in the okay. future. Well, as I said a moment ago, I, I think first of all, until we face up to the fundamental questions of how to balance security, where does it fit in as a national priority? It's not, can't be, won't be an absolute, but it needs to be an important factor. Mm -hmm. uh, number two, how are we going to organize that security um, between the federal government and state, local, and private actors? And number three, how are we going to pay for that security? Right. Once we get beyond uh, that point, there, there are a number of other uh, important principles that a variety of groups over the recent years that have looked at aviation and transportation security have, uh, have come up with. Uh, they include, for example, the validity of this baseline concept, mm -hmm. not only in aviation security, right. uh, but throughout, um, so that you move away from um, you know, code yellow, um, uh, and and toward uh, a system that that's, that's that exists in, in all mm -hmm. uh, at all times. Right. Uh, that you have a system that relies on better and faster information sharing. I agree, I agree with, with that completely. With state and local mm -hmm. uh, uh, shareholders right. as well as the private sector. Well, that that's excellent. I think we're going to have to leave it oh, there. Okay. But I think you have left us with a lot to think about and a lot to do, as this book does as well. Thank you. Thank you very much for being with us today. Okay. And that's our program. We appreciate your comments, and you can reach us at dialogue at wilsoncenter.org. I'm George Liston CA, and you've been watching Dialogue, a co-production of the Woodrow Wilson International Center for Scholars and MHC Networks. Dialogue is also on the MHC Worldview channel, which is available to public TV stations nationwide. For more information, go to www.mhcworldview.org. And please join us again right here next week. And thank you for watching. And thank you, Bill. That's great. Okay. Is it okay? It's very good.